All right, part one is you can get SPSS free through Alliant. So don't buy it. Don't get the down, don't get the 30 day trial or anything. You can get it free from Alliant. Um, it's, it's off of the, you can either go directly to the IT department and they'll send you the link. You got to fill out a little minor form and they make sure that you're an Alliant student. Once they're sure that you're an Alliant student, they will go ahead and send you where to download it and the 97 digit secret code number that you have to put in there to make it run. So, but again, it works pretty good. This is version 26. And I, I just, I'm using a data sheet that we use for our methodology cop exam here because it's got a ton of good variables in here. Okay. So real quick, uh, let me show you what is a bad data sheet looks like, you know, and I'm not knocking a student. She just graduated. She just success, successfully defended. Yay, yesterday. So everybody's happy. And I'm trying to convince her that she needs to go to Jamaica for a couple of weeks. She deserves it because she works so hard. But she's got uh, internships, so she really can't go anywhere. But now look at this data, okay? What's wrong with this data is it's text. You can't use text in SPSS. It doesn't know what to do with text in SPSS. So when Where's you, the when text? you that, that's Where's just the, uh, words, anything that's so, a word. So the sheet that I see is all numbers. Oh, you guys can't see this one either. All right. Hold on a second. But what the heck? Well, I'll just bounce around. We'll get this thing working here. Okay. This is how she downloaded it from SPSS. Okay. Now there are some numbers. That was a good part. But she had so much of her data that she had to recode. So remember, you do not want text on your SPSS sheet. You want the good stuff. So let me close this one out. Boom. Move this this one. Main part. So it looks like a spreadsheet. That's all it really is. It's just a spreadsheet. But there's two parts. If you look down here in the bottom left-hand corner, the data view that's where all the numbers are. Each one of these columns is a variable. Say that again. Each column is a variable. And where the numbers are, that's the data view. Part two, this other tab, the variable view, you have to tell the computer what certain aspects about your variable. Okay. There's the name. Um, the type, they should all be numeric. Uh, width, that's not important. Decimals, that's not important. Now, the label, this is what the, the put out, the output will show. Okay? So there's a lot of restrictions about the naming of a variable in SPSS. No spaces, no hyphens, no periods, no nothing except for letters and numbers. And you can't even start off with a number. So it's very, very picky about the name but then in the label part, you can name it whatever you want. And this is what shows up in the output, okay? And if it's a categorical variable, you know, you, you mark what it is over here, right? The measurement type. So it only recognizes three type, a scale, which we call continuous. Sorry, I got to keep an eye open for my grandson. He's a sneaky little kid. And then ordinal, right? That's like a liquor scale type of thing. And then nominal. If it's nominal, right, the little three balloons, then then you should put something in the in the values box because it tells you what the numbers mean. So for ethnicity, number one, if that if that person is marked with a one, that means he falls into the white category, two Latino, three African American, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So important. If it says nominal, then it should have something here in the value sections that tells you what the numbers stand for. Right. And very important. You got to you got to get good at, at defining what type of variable you're dealing with here. And again, there's the there's three that SPSS uses. There is a fourth one. It's called an interval variable. Don't ever use it. It's 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 ridiculous. Um, so don't use it. But there's three. Right. So a scaled variable is like a number line. It's, it's what most of us use to measure with, right? Um, test scores, 
how much you weigh, how much you bring home money-wise, how many miles you drive, right? Where a number makes sense. That's that's a scale variable, a continuous variable. And then an ordinal is level. Think level. Like like how much money these guys make, you know, 20 to 30,000 is level one, 30 to 40,000 is level two. That kind of thing where the higher the number in an ordinal ranking system, the more of whatever it is you're measuring, the more of the characteristic. Liquor scales are all ordinal. So that makes it kind of easy there. And then the last one is nominal and that's a categorical variable. All right. So I figured I'd start off easy. Now, a lot of these tests have what we call assumptions. If the assumption isn't met, then you probably shouldn't use that test. And a, a rule of thumb is the more complicated the test gets, the more assumptions that you're going to have. So let's check everybody's favorite assumption. It's called normality. Now, very important. Nominal variables do not have normality. Remember, for a nominal variable, a number is simply replacing the name. So it's not acting like a, a number, right? Like four isn't better than two when it's a nominal variable. Nominal variable, the numbers simply are replacing names, okay? So we don't ever look for assumptions on nominal variables, only the scales. The scales have to be normal for most of these tests. So here's a good one, depression, okay? And you look at the scores here, and it looks like they go from 60 to the low all the way up to 160 to the high. Now we're going to check to see if it's normal or not. And... Um, okay, can you guys see this thing? You, you tell me if, if the Zoom thing doesn't show up, right? Uh, or the, can, can you see the SPSS sheet? We see the spreadsheet. Okay. So everything, not everything, but 95% of everything you're going to do at SPSS is you go to analyze, right? This is all the miracles of statistics are right here, okay? So we're going to go to Descriptive Statistics, and we're going to go to Explore, and I want to see if depression fits a normal distribution. So you click it over to the dependence list, and if you're not sure what these are, I suggest you click on them until you know what you're doing. So it's automatically going to give you the descriptives. That's your mean, your standard deviation, the mode, the range, all that other stuff. Okay. And then plots. So we don't use the stem and leap plot anymore. I haven't used that in about 30 years. But we do use the histogram. Now, very important. The histogram, even though it might look normal, it's not always normal. So the histogram can be a little misleading. We're going to use this one. Normality plots with tests. There are two mathematical tests that will check for normality with us or for us, and that's the ones we're going to use. And then you simply click OK, or I'm sorry, continue OK. Ta -da. And so there's the function we picked and depression. So it tells us there's 120 people in that variable. Excuse me, Richard, it doesn't come through. Thank you. That's what I need to hear, OK? So let me switch it over again. All right. So, okay, so, now we see it. so explore, right? Yeah. Now, this is something I just found out recently. If I was going to use this to go back to, back and forth to when I'm writing my dissertation, I could type, I could just double click on there and say, or depression. See that? And this is relatively new. So I think this has only happened since like version 23, so now this is version 26. But you can write on this now, right? So again, your sample size is 120, and there's a lot missing because some of the other variables have more people in it. That's all it is. So you don't really need to look at the missing part. And then there's the average depression score, 89.61, with the standard error. And then here's, here's all the what we call the uh, 
measures of central tendency, right? The median, the variance, standard deviation, blah, 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 okay? Now, there's your histogram. Does that look normal to you? No, that's not normal. Remember, a normal looks like the hump. It looks like, a, you know, a nice symmetrical. Bell curve. Yeah, bell curve. I call it the camel. But this is what you're going to cite, right? There's two tests of normality. The kolmogorov smirnov test and then the Shapiro-Wilk test. Normally, they agree, okay? Normally, they agree, but they're actually two separate tests. And then one is made for large sample sizes and one is made for small sample sizes. And no fooling you guys, depending on which book you, you read, they kind of say, well, this is for large and this is for small. But what I tell people is, you know, just pick the one you want. It, it usually, and again, most of the times they will agree. Okay. So it's not a normal data set. So you would not use this on for like a, like a T-test or an ANOVA where the data has to be normal. You know, it, uh, and a, hundred, a lot of times it doesn't have to be really normal. You can get away with violating some of the assumptions you can because like the T-test, the ANOVA, those are what we call robust tests. And even though they violate an assumption, you could still run them and the results would still be considered valid and reliable, okay? Going back to the data sheet here. All right. So, all right, now, okay, so I'm going to just start running through a couple of little tests. And again, everything I do here, it's in the Hawk 2, Hawk 3. Through the Moodle, they're self-enrolling. If you have, if you get stuck, just let me know. I'll, I'll enroll you and send you the links. So I'm going to test this weight here. Right, I'm going to say um, the average weight. This is like the, the weight of 20 football players. Uh, we used to have a team here in San Diego called the San Diego Chargers. But they're gone. So this was the average. This was the weight of the, the offensive line, right? 20 guys, right? There's a bunch of big guys. And the NFL says the average weight for all offensive linemen is 275. So if it's coming from the NFL, we're assuming that that is a fact, right? Because they are the authority. So that's what we call a, a, um, a population statement. So we're going to test our average of our 20 against the number 275. That's what we call a one sample t-test. So we're going to go to analyze. Compare means because that's what t-tests do. They compare means. One sample t-test. And it's asking, okay, what's the variable name? And it is weight. Very important. Too many people miss this box. And we got to test it against what the stated norm was. And in this problem, that would be 275. Click OK. And I got to switch back to the output. And here's our t-test. And again, okay, so this the, the n tells us how many. So from our sample mean was 285, comparing it to 275. And this, according to the output here, the t-test statistic was 3.778, which literally means that the difference between the sa our sample mean of 285 and the stated norm of 275, there were 3.778 standard deviations away from each other, which is too many to be considered something happening by chance. So because our SIG value is less than 0 0.05, we get to say that it was a significant difference, period. Okay, done. Let's run an independent sample now. So let's say, let's see, I need a, I need a grouping variable in here. It's got two groups. Let's pick gender, right? 
So zero is male, one is female. So let's see if there's any significant difference between the males and the females when it comes to, I don't know, job satisfaction. Right? See that one? So what the computer's going to do is going to find the average of the males, average satisfaction scores for the males, Average satisfaction score for the females, and then it's going to run a t-test. So again, this is what we call an independent t-test. We're going to go to analyze, compare means again, but this time we're going to independent samples t-test, and we're going to use gender. Where's gender? 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 The third one from the top. Thank you. And we're that's our grouping variable. Very important. You have to tell the computer what numbers you're using and we use zero for men one for women and we're going to do job satisfaction where's job satisfaction Here is. now remember with all job satisfaction you got to look out for the um what we call the mick jagger effect anybody get that joke <laughs> from the song can't right. get no. Right. He don't get no satisfaction. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Becky, you are now on my <laughs> good list. Okay. So, <laughs> so let me let me switch to the output. Now, this output is a lot. There's a lot of important stuff here, right? Um hmm. It, it, right off the bat, it tells you how many males there were in the sample versus how many females. So you got this, this unequal sample size. That's bad. That's really bad. And the calculations will tell you so, right? And, and you know, even though there is a big difference, your sample size, if they're, if they're this far apart, it could definitely sink you, right? It could, it could not be, it would not show significance. But but there's the means right there, 7 and 5.3. Uh, it doesn't look like a big mean difference, right? It looks like, what, 1.7 difference. But the standard deviation is kind of small. So you go down here. So the, this is this is a different output. The independent sample t-test, the first thing it does, these first two columns, it checks for homogeneity of variance, which is the second assumption of a t-test first one is the data has to fit a normal curve the second assumption is that the variance in other words the spread of the variant the variables that the spread of the measurements away from the mean of that data set should be relatively the same and it because this is not less than 0.05 that means it did not violate wait, wait, wait. wait somebody got a question all right, moving on. So so here's, okay, there's your T-score, degrees of freedom, and here's your two-tailed test. You'll notice that one is, is significant, right? If the assumptions, if the assumption of homogeneity of Barry was not violated, and it wasn't, we would use this top row. So we could say, yeah, there's a significant difference in the average depression scores between the men and the women. Males have... I'm sorry, job satisfaction. Males have significantly higher job satisfaction scores than females, according to this output. Okay. Um, time is just flying by. Do you guys want to run an ANOVA or anything? Or what should I just run an ANOVA? Maybe a regression real quick? Or I appreciate it all. You got it. Okay, so and these are the big ones, right? T-test, probably the most popular test in, in statistics. Um, correlations. ANOVAs. ANOVAs are like big T-tests, but instead of comparing two groups, you're comparing more than two groups through the means of the groups. And then for the correlation side, you do multiple regression to try to see who's doing what. Um, okay, hold on. So let's switch over again. All right, so 
that was a t test we compared two groups let's let's do a one way between group ANOVA. so i got something up here called position and it's got one two three groups right if they're marked with a one or a manager two their staff three their executive so let's see if there's a significant difference in i don't know um about effectiveness. Yeah, effectiveness. So effectiveness that, you know, the higher the number, the more effective they are. Okay. So we're going to go to analyze. We're going to go down to general linear model. Now there's more than one way to run an ANOVA here, but believe you me, stick to the general linear model because this does all your ANOVAs there's another one I'll show you real quick. Descriptives. Um, what is it? Uh, descriptives. Is it cross tabs? No. It is descriptives, frequencies. No, 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 no. Descriptives. Oh, crap. Hold on a second. All right. Uh, there is one way ANOVA. Don't use that one. Don't do not use that one. It'll come out the same way this one is. But again, general linear model. It does all your ANOVAs. And, and the between group, one way ANOVA is, is the first step of the ANOVA. There's literally about a dozen more types of ANOVA. They just get harder and harder and harder. So let's take our position and make that the fixed factor. In SPSS, factor means categorical variable, a grouping variable. Okay. And effectiveness is going to be our dependent variable. So nothing, 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 don't really care here. Da, 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 da. Now, a postdoc test is after it runs the test and you get a significant F, it says, yeah, there's a significant difference in effectiveness between the groups in there somewhere, but it doesn't tell you exactly between who, right? It could be between the staff and the executives or the managers and the executives. It doesn't tell you where it is. So that's when you run the postdoc test and it gets real, real scientific, real forensic. And it looks at the difference between all possible groups and it'll tell you which ones are significant or not. And down here in San Diego, we always use the Tukey test because it's the most fun to say Tukey Tukey. And our options, always get the descriptives because you're going to want to look at the means of the groups. Effect size, that's the percent of the variance in the dB that you can explain. And power, you want a power of at least 0.8. And then our homogeneity variance test. So this one's going to do check most of our assumptions for us. Okay. And, and the rest is history. You just click OK. And I got to switch. Please hold. I'm getting pretty fast at this now. So univariate. Analysis of variance, that's what we call our ANOVA. Tells you how many people in each group, right? 14, 11, 11. It's not perfect, but it's pretty close. So that's not going to be a problem. And then, I, you know, when I, teach, when I teach this stuff, I tell you guys to just look at the means first, because that's what the ANOVA is doing. It's just looking at the means. You look at the, the lowest mean. So the staff have, have about an 8.7 effectiveness score, and the managers have about 11.6. So there's a, there's a difference of about three points in there. Now, we don't know if that's significant or not. So that's when we drop down to the test table. But before we do that, you look at the Levine's test. This checks assumption number two. Is the variance in each of the little levels, the subgroups, does the spread of the data away from the mean is it relatively the same for the managers, for the staff, for the executive? That's what that means. And because the significance, and we always do it based on a mean, and because the significance is not less than 0.05, that means it did not violate that assumption. So far, so good. Okay. Moving down, here's your money box right here. This is your um, source of variance table. So because we only have one variable, called position, it should, it should look exactly like the corrected model variable. So the first row and the third row are identical because we only got one variable. 
And we never look at the intercept throw, okay? You know, we all make that mistake. The intercept really doesn't come into play when we run the ANOVAs, okay? So try not to look at them. But according to this, we got an F ratio of 2.7, 2, 2.876. And what that literally means is that when it comes to explaining the variance, that 2.876 times the variance of within group variance is coming from between groups. So that there's the only two types of variance there is, is between the group variance or within the group variance. Within the group variance, there's nothing you can do about it. As a researcher, the data just comes that way, right? Your data is spread all over the place. Um, but between group variance, it could be because of the groups, right? That's what you're trying to prove. And unfortunately, it was not significant because it wasn't less than 0 0.05. And the effect size is 0 0.148, which is kind of small. And your power wasn't big enough. Your power should be 0 0.8 or above. Now, power at this stage of the game means your sample size wasn't big enough, right? When your sample size goes up, your power goes up. Your power, by definition, is the ability of your test to accurately reject the null hypothesis. Okay? And then the post hoc test, it really doesn't make a difference because if the original F is not significant, then none of your post hocs will be significant as well. Right? This, this first F here is what we call an omnibus F. All right, I'm going to real quick go through some a couple correlations and maybe a quick regression. Um, we're out of time already, but you guys stick around. I'll stick around. All right. So how many of you guys know about the hawk boodles that's got everything that you will ever need to know about statistics? I try to explain it to you in words. But there's like 350 videos in there nowadays. So, again, you want to see how to run a multiple regression model? Go to Hawk 3. Those are all the correlations and regressions. You want to run a mixed ANOVA? Go to Hawk 2. So, Hawk 2 has all the T-tests and all your ANOVA family. Okay, so though between those two Hawks, I guarantee you anything and everything that you're going to either need to on your dissertation or be taught in a class at Alliant will be on one of those things. Several of them, right? I make several versions of the same thing over and over again. So, um, okay. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Um, on that Moodle page, so I'm doing a qualitative dissertation. Is there like a way, is there an instructional video for like which one to select? Like where to go with what data you would need for that specific purpose on Moodle? The bad news is we don't really do much for qualitative. So um, we do have a qualitative Moodle, but it's, you know, I don't, personally, I don't know anything about qualitative, but some of the students that have done qualitative over the years, they, they donated a little bit here, a little bit there. So, but again, there's none of the tutors know qualitative um, and I don't know qualitative either, but I'll send you the link. Go ahead and email me. Um, I believe, are you familiar with the uh, dissertation toolbox Moodle? Um, I haven't looked at that yet, no. Okay, because I know there's a link in there. Um, go ahead and send me a link, and I'll I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and, and send you the Moodle link and show you what we do have on qualitative. So, and again, we, we just do not have anybody that knows qualitative, so we can't offer any kind of support on that. <clears throat> Number one request we get these days is statistics, statistics, statistics. And in the old days, we used to get some writing requests, too. But even that's dropped off because of this damn COVID thing. So, but yeah, we'll, we'll see what we can do. Okay, where was I? Okay, so let's do, let's run a correlation. Correlation. So correlation is a number that measures the strength and the relationship between two variables, right? It's like a cause and effect thing. But we don't say cause and attack. We don't cut. We don't say cause and effect. So here's one: fear of stats. Right? The higher the number, the more afraid of stats they are. And pretest exam scores. 
So we're going to see if how afraid of stats they are is related to their pretest scores. We're going to go to analyze, correlate, bivariate. That means two variables. And that's the only ones you can have. You can only have two variables in a, in a correlation. And what did I say? Pretest and pure stats. Can you guys see this one? Yes. Uh, there's pretest. No, wrong one. Uh, there it is. Pre okay, pure stats and pretest scores. And this is all set up already. You just put those in there and click it. Boom. Oh, now I got to switch back again. Sorry. Hold on. Eh, 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 eh. New share. Oh, look at that. Hey, I'm learning every time here. Ta -da. Correlation. Pearson's correlation. That's the number one we got here. And you know what? It's a significant correlation, right? Because it's got the significance right there. 0.016, which is much smaller than 0.05. And it looks to me like it's a negative number. So in other words, when the fear of stats goes up, their pretest scores go down. So the their their fear, their innate fear of statistics is affecting their pretest scores. That's what that says. So so last thing, I'm gonna run a regression on, I'm gonna see if. Fear of stats scores affects their final exam scores, and their pretest scores affects their final exam scores. In other words, do fear of stats and their pretest scores, do they significantly predict their final exam scores? Okay, that's a, that's a prediction model. That's a multiple regression model. Ready? Again, analyze regression and... Because we're a, what they call a soft science, um, for the social science, we always assume that all the variables are linearly related. You don't have to really understand that. But we just assume that the relationship between any two variables forms a straight line. And, you know, if we were an engineering school, we would show you other kinds of ways. But we just got to keep it basic for you. <laughs> And, okay, so fear of stats is a predictor, right? That's an IV. Pre-tests. And so let's just say what their midterm, we're trying to see if they're related to their midterm scores, right? And we always want R squared change, descriptives, parts and partials, collinearity. Now, a regression has five major assumptions okay and i think that's all yeah that's all here we go all right re-switching and there's your regression now this is always kind of funny because you get the mean and the standard deviation for all the variables but you know what you don't need them you don't use them the software uses them, but you as the researcher, you really don't care what the averages are because correlations don't really care about averages. I mean, they're used in the calculations, but that's that's it. You're not going to mention them in your paper. Right? All right. Here's a correlation box. It tells you who's correlated with who. But no, we don't really care about that one either. We want to go to the, actually, your first thing you're going to look at is your ANOVA box. Yes. Regressions subsume the ANOVA. In other words, the ANOVA test is used in a regression. In fact, without going into too much detail, the ANOVA is actually a regression before it's anything else. But, you know, you'd have to, I need a degree in statistics to, to make you guys understand it because I'm not sure I understand it either. But when you run a regression, first thing you look at is the ANOVA. If it's significant, that means your model is significant. So in other words, one at least one of your variables, either the fear of stats or the pretest variables, is significantly correlated to the DV, which in this one are the midterm scores. So that's the first thing you look at. Second thing you look at, you look at your R square. That's your effect size. 
The effect size is, by definition, effect size is the percent of the variance in the dB that you can explain with your model. So in other words, you can explain about 32% of the variance in, in the midterm scores based on either the fear stats or their pretest scores, okay? And then we go down to the coefficients box. This is a cool box. This will tell you which of your predictor variables is significant and which one is not. And if there's more than one that's significant, it tells you which one's the strongest predictor. So we, if we look at the fear stats here, we go to the right, we look at the SIG value. And because it's not less than 0.05, that means the fear stats score had nothing to do with their midterm scores. Got it? Even though they could be terrified of stats, it did not affect their midterm exam scores. But now the pretest scores did. Because this is less than 0.05, that means that this predictor variable was significant at predicting their final exam scores or their midterm scores. And the rest of this stuff is just kind of, you know, um, assumption related, like your Mahalanobis distance, like your Durbin Watson, where's your Dur there's your collinearity, and where's your Durbin Watson? This way up here. Uh, oh, I don't think I checked it. But okay, that's about it in a nutshell.